Uh, I'm delighted. I'm Bob Nelson, the director of the Barr Foundation, and um, I'm delighted to invite you all, or to welcome you all, all here tonight for remarks by uh, Terry Halday, who is a research professor at the ABF. Uh, Terry received his PhD from the University of Chicago and is one of the co-directors of the ABF Center on Law and Globalization. Uh, Terry is uh, one of our uh, long-standing superstars at the ABF. Uh, his last book, Bankrupt, uh, won a number of book prizes. And uh, he is talking tonight about some very exciting research that he's conducting uh, on China. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn the podium to Terry. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Bob. It's a great pleasure to be here and also a pleasure that by a happy coincidence, Sadar Le, my co-investigator and co-author on the China work, is able to be here uh, with us as well. Tonight, I'm going to uh, introduce you to China's hidden heroes. Uh, these are criminal defense lawyers who say that their criminal practice is tantamount to dancing handcuffed in a minefield. And the portraits that Sadar and I are going to give you come from five years of research that we've been doing across China. And we've been doing this with the support of the American Bar Foundation. We thank particularly the fellows of the American Bar Foundation for their support and also from the National Science Foundation. The photo of this man, his image and his name have been splashed across the headlines of the newspapers of the world, Beaujolais. It's one of the most dramatic stories that have come out of China for a very long time. It continues to unfold with uh, new revelations day by day. Some people have called this the biggest political storm in China since uh, Tiananmen Square in 1989. Beaujolai was the party boss, the most powerful politician in the huge city, a city of 30 million people, Chongqing, in the western province, sort of situated inside the western province of Sichuan. Uh, Sadar and I have been doing some field work there. He was a member of the Politburo, and he seemed to be on the way to the Standing Committee of the Politburo uh, and possibly into China's top leadership. And then everything came apart. His trusted police chief sought political asylum at the British consulate and at the American consulate. Uh, he got asylum at neither place. But he alleged that Beaujolais had been running Chongqing like a fiefdom. And if people didn't like what Beaujolais was doing, they risked being disappeared. And so the police chief said he feared for his life. But the story continues to unfold. Now we hear that Beaujolais' wife uh, may be complicit in the murder of a British businessman in a Chongqing hotel. Beaujolais himself has been sacked from, uh, as party chief of Chongqing. He's been thrown out of the Politburo, and undoubtedly there is more to come. But this is not just a political drama. This is also a significant legal event because Beaujolais mounted a powerful strike hard campaign, as the Chinese called it, against the mafia in Chongqing. And along the way, uh, there was arrested a mafia chief and his family got a lawyer from Beijing, a well-known uh, criminal rights lawyer, criminal defense lawyer <coughs> called Li Zhuang to come and defend him. When Li Zhuang arrived in Chongqing, uh, he talked to uh, uh, the mafia chief, and the mafia chief told him that he'd confessed, but it was a false confession because he'd been tortured. Li Zhuang went into court with the story, and the court heard the story, but a few days later, the mafia chief said, no, that was a true confession. I only gave you that story because the lawyer had confused me and told me uh, to commit perjury. What then happened was that Li Zhuang fell victim to one of the most draconian measures feared by China's criminal lawyers. They call it Big Stick 306. When clients change their stories, prosecutors can accuse lawyers of perverting justice and the lawyers then become subject to arrest. So indeed, here's Li Zhuang. He was arrested, convicted and sentenced to prison. This is a notable legal event because we think that this produced the strongest mobilization of lawyers across China uh, since the Cultural Revolution. They went to the media. They protested in hundreds outside the courtroom and inside the courtroom. They wrote open letters to the top leaders of uh, China's political system. In the first instance, they were protesting the treatment of Li Zhuang, but in fact, they were really indirectly talking about the threat 
to strong advocacy, fearless advocacy by every one of them wherever they lived in China. This development is so important, we think, that we've written an article on the Li Zhuang affair and we've interviewed numbers of Li Zhuang's lawyers. But why does it matter so much in China that lawyers, criminal lawyers, be able to be fearless advocates? There's another China that uh, people from the outside rarely see. Every year in China, there are tens of thousands, some people estimate 100,000 social disturbances or riots across the country uh, this year. Children are poisoned. There's police brutality, rampant corruption, religious persecution, expropriated property, forced abortions. In situations like this, people rise up, and when people rise up and protest, here are prospects for uh, heroic criminal lawyering. We don't hear very much about it because of the Great Firewall of China. This firewall is built to keep in embarrassing incidents, like these 100,000 or so riots or disturbances. It's designed to keep out threatening information that would fuel the fire. And it's designed to keep information from circulating inside China and thus uh, stirring up more social disturbance. Inevitably, of course, these protests lead to arrests. And at this point, ordinary criminal lawyers get caught up in China's turbulent countryside. These ordinary lawyers, their faces we don't see, their voices we don't hear, and their stories are never told. So one of the challenges for our project has been to find these lawyers and to understand what are their stories. Now what is the link between Li Zhuang on the one side, eminent criminal defense lawyer, and the ordinary lawyers of China on the other? We argue in our work that there's a powerful underlying motif. In both cases, there is a fight for basic legal freedoms. In both cases, there is a struggle for what we call political liberalism. So Sadar and I and our research place what's going on in China in the context of a much broader global movement comparatively and historically. For the last 20 years, I've been working with a French sociologist, Lucien Carpique and Malcolm Feely at Berkeley. And we've brought together country specialists on some 25 countries from different disciplines to investigate the politics of lawyers. Across history and spanning continents, we have found that frequently, but certainly not always, frequently lawyers are engaged in a distinctive kind of politics. This is a politics that is usually fighting for a moderate state. They want some kind of internal fracturing of the state. We think of it in part as separation of powers. Lawyers always want to see some kind of civil society where power stands outside the state, not least, of course, because lawyers want to have their own associations which are not controlled by the state. These lawyers frequently fight for basic legal freedoms, the classic negative freedoms, habeas corpus, freedom from arbitrary arrest, torture, killing, positive freedoms, the ability to have a lawyer, positive political rights, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of movement, and of course, property rights. Now, invariably, these lawyers across countries and across time are divided by party politics. But if ever there is a possibility that they will mobilize jointly, together, collectively, this is where they find common ground. And we call this political liberalism. We began our studies by looking at Europe over four centuries. We extended our investigation to East Asia and Latin America. And in the last few weeks, this book has just come out on former British colonies that got independence after World War II in South Asia, in Southeast Asia, and in Africa. And from the 30 or so countries that we study over time and place, here is a consistent theme. Lawyers can often be found fighting for political liberalism. So China is our most intensive case study yet because we're asking ourselves these questions. Can we find in China a struggle for basic legal freedoms? Is there any sign in China that there is a fight for political liberalism? And we've decided that criminal defense law is the place to look and hence our study of criminal defense lawyers. Our answer at this moment is yes. There are two sorts of heroes 
in China at least that we identify. One of the Li Zhuangs of life and human rights lawyers uh, who often the state seeks to hide away because they're an embarrassment to the state. And then there are all those ordinary, unknown, largely uncelebrated lawyers who do, who do work that looks mundane. They move forward the criminal justice system a tiny step at a time. And all of these lawyers are operating against a backdrop of fear. So let me say a few words about what we've discovered about ordinary lawyers. Because it's very difficult to do research on ordinary lawyers in China or on lawyers in general in China because you can't do a representative survey. And you can't really talk to lawyers unless there's somebody to introduce you. So how can you handle a country of one and a half billion people? We had the wonderful good fortune, I have the wonderful good fortune of working with Sadar. And Sadar stumbled across, I, I'm sure Sadar purposely found, <laughs> a marvelous online forum where some 30,000 lawyers from all China's provinces talked to each other about everything that was on their mind. And they talked remarkably openly. Actually, we know exactly what they said to each other because Sadar was part of the forum and he had access to the garbage can so we could also see what was, <laughs> what was censored. So we've been, uh, Sadar has been rummaging around in the garbage can. <laughs> we were very fortunate in, in this data source because it permitted us to look, as it were, through a one-way mirror to see or hear what lawyers were saying without disturbing what they were just saying in the process. And we found that many lawyers across China talk to each other in the talk of basic legal freedoms or what we call political liberalism. Many lawyers call for restraints on state power. This is the uh, online forum that we refer to. Uh, many lawyers call for restraints on uh, state power, what we've called the moderate state. They resist what they call the rule of man. They bemoan the lack of judicial independence from party control. Indeed, they have an almost reverential belief in the possibility of law. These lawyers also have a strong sense of the need for professional community. They want to have a capacity for self-defense. They view themselves, in fact, as a foundation of civil society. As this lawyer said, lawyers should be the tower of strength in the society. Their great hope is to be able to join forces across provinces, across cities, across the country. We cannot protect our own rights, said a lawyer. This is the tragedy of China's rule of law. To unite is the only way out for lawyers. These lawyers also critique the balance of power inside China's justice system. Said a lawyer, lawyers have an extremely unequal position compared with the police, the procuracy, and judici the judiciary. Expecting help from them is like looking for fish in the forest. One marvelous thing about doing research in China is the fabulous metaphorical environment uh, that the Chinese uh, live within. But we've also found that Chinese lawyers not only have hopes, but they have fears, they have frustrations, and they have terrible hindrances. We've talked about Article 306, which gives prosecutors almost unlimited power to punish defense lawyers who present evidence that's different from that collected by the police and offered by the procuracy. Hundreds of lawyers in China have been arrested and detained under Article 306. And so one lawyer captured beautifully the sentiment of China's lawyers with the comment, Article 306 makes the legal profession tremble. But lawyers also confront what they call the three difficulties. Chinese lawyers complain vigorously that they find it difficult to meet with criminal suspects. And even, even when they get to meet with criminal suspects, frequently a policeman insists on being in the room. They have difficulty sometimes getting access to case files, but when they get the files, all of the prosecutor's information is not there. To collect evidence because of Article 306 is dangerous, and it's even more difficult to bring witnesses into court. So with these restrictions, it's exceedingly difficult for criminal defense lawyers in China to mount any kind of effective defense for their clients. A key finding then of our research already is that lawyers run major risks in vigorous criminal defense. These are risks not only to practice and to income, they are also potentially risks to their person and in some cases, risks to their life. But we wanted to understand how far does this influence, the influence of criminal defense lawyers extend in China. 
There's a trap that many foreigners fall into when they look at China because they think that the criminal justice, justice system is the principal institution dealing with social control, the principal coercive institution in the society. But in fact, China has no less than five systems of coercive control. It has the criminal justice system. We saw the picture of Beaujolais in court. Lawyers have a presence there. It's an expanding presence, but as you've heard already, it's subject to severe limits. Here is Beaujolais uh, reported in the local Chinese newspaper. There's a second system that many people think is as big as the entire criminal justice system in China, and that's called re-education through labor. The country is covered with labor camps, so people for certain kinds of offenses uh, can be uh, d detained and sent to a labor camp for up to three years. Lawyers have no presence there, except perhaps at the margins. And then there is the most feared of all, the state security, the secret police, who can snatch you out of your home in the middle of the night. Lawyers tremble and keep well away from state security uh, and are completely excluded from it. Uh, there's another system, the party disciplinary system. The Communist Party has its own internal disciplinary system where it deals with its own people. We assume this is where Beaujolais is right at this moment, uh, but lawyers are not involved. They only get involved if people go through the party disciplinary system frequently they're thrown out of the party and then pushed into the criminal justice system. There's also an administrative law system for small petty crimes, for drug use, prostitution, and so on. Now, we were concerned whether the many interviews that we've done in about 13 cities could be reproduced in small towns and small cities, provinces where we couldn't go, either because I, a foreigner, couldn't easily be there uh, or because we didn't have connections and networks. Here is a map of China, and each of these uh, blue uh, pointers indicates where we have conducted interviews ourselves. But we found 15 graduate students at the Chinese University of Politics and Law in Beijing, and we trained them uh, in a systematic interview schedule that they then took back to their hometowns. And we asked them to find five lawyers in their circle and to interview them. So we got 112 structured interviews. And here are some of the key findings we discovered that about 20% of these people are motivated, these criminal defense lawyers, are motivated by what they call political liberalism, or what we call political liberalism. No, they don't call it political liberalism. None of these lawyers had actually worked inside the criminal justice system itself, and none of these lawyers uh, had been party cadres, party officials. These lawyers overwhelmingly say that the goal of China's criminal defense system is not striking crimes, as the Chinese say, but is protecting citizens' legal rights. These lawyers insist that procedural rights are every bit as important and maybe more important than substantive rights. So our summary finding is that it's quite possible that 10 or 20 percent of China's criminal lawyers uh, uh, of and possibly uh, of uh, China's lawyers as a whole, these hidden criminal lawyers hold politically liberal ideals. Or put another way, they're doing their criminal defense work not just simply to earn a living, not just simply to pursue a career, not even to pursue professional ideals. These people do their everyday criminal practice because they believe they are creating a different kind of political society. A word or two about notable lawyers. When we first began our research in Beijing, we talked to distinguished law professors and others who'd been involved in the drafting of the 1996 criminal procedure law. But we didn't focus on leading human rights lawyers because things had already been written about them. We became aware through some high profile criminal cases and some conversations with people of an interesting finding. Somebody said to us, did we know that something like 40% of China's top 30 human rights lawyers are Christians? This is a great uh, uh, overrepresentation, of course, of Christians in the society. You probably number no more than 100 million or 120 million. And we were puzzled by this. Why should this be the case? What we've discovered is that they, these lawyers are embroiled in a largely invisible drama that potentially affects the political stability of the country as a whole, certainly in the minds of its security apparatus. The security apparatus is desperately afraid that criminal lawyers and human rights lawyers could become leaders of a political movement. And here's their logic. 
The logic is that persecuted Christians all over China come to Beijing to get criminal defense, and they go to Christian criminal defense lawyers. These lawyers might then become leaders of China's largest civil society group, which are the 50 to 70 million Protestant Christians in uh, house churches. And when this alliance pulls together, it might then link arms with international organizations, religious organizations, international human rights groups, and other groups. And so out of this allegiance, out of this alliance, might come a, a political movement that builds from religious impulses. I've spent countless hours uh, talking to many of these lawyers over the last 18 months, and this is what we've found, some of the findings. It is true that the government, the security apparatus, is desperately afraid that after the Arab Spring, there could be a similar Arab Spring in China, dubbed the Jasmine Revolution, and they have brutally and severely cracked down on human rights lawyers of all sorts, including the Christian human rights lawyers. These lawyers fear torture. Chiang Kai, a lawyer in his late 30s, I've spent a lot of time with over the last few years, told me that last year he was driving his latest model Honda down the Third Ring Road uh, in Beijing. It's a road a bit like Lakeshore Drive, late at night, through a residential area, and suddenly he realized that he was being surrounded by three unmarked black cars that forced him to a halt. Men dressed in black leapt out of those cars, brandishing pipes, and started beating his car, beating his windows, he thought, to get hold of him and the person who was with him. He was desperately afraid. He jammed his foot on the accelerator. Uh, he pressed between two of the cars, and one of the great ironies of life raced off to a police station where he thought he might get protection. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this man, uh, Tang Jitian. These lawyers fear being disappeared as they call it. Sadar and I interviewed this man in a downtown Beijing hotel and we were shocked because he was later seized, taken back to his home province, uh, put in a prison in a, in a cold refrigerated cell, stripped naked. Cold fans were, uh, were uh, uh, beamed on him. Uh, and uh, after a week, uh, he was not only desperately ill, but it seemed that he had contracted TB. And then there is this man in the uh, bottom right-hand corner as you look at the screen, Mr. Zhang. I interviewed him in an upstairs darkened restaurant near the West Beijing railway station a few months ago. And as he was busily dismantling his iPhone, he just assumed that security was listening in through his iPhone, so he took it apart while we were talking. Uh, I asked him, what do you fear most? He said, what I fear is walking down some Beijing street and a van pulls up alongside me. And men jump out, seize me, place me in the van, put a black hood over my head, and I disappear completely. Nobody knows where I am, including my family. And four weeks later, I read in the New York Times that this is exactly what had happened to Mr. Zhang. So these people are people of great courage. And we wanted to understand what gives them that courage. The secular human rights lawyers point to their strong moral and political values in support of democracy and rule of law and what we've called political liberalism. The Christian human rights lawyers draw a direct link between their theology, their Christian beliefs on the one side, and their understanding of rule of law on the other. They also draw from each other a great deal of solidarity from the house churches and from meeting together. Indeed, how do these lawyers protect themselves in such extreme circumstances? They obviously meet together whenever possible, but the security police have made that increasingly difficult. Many of them use online blogs, Twitter and other social media. Here's Chiang Kai's blog, which can report on cases as they unfold. Chiang Kai has used Twitter to mobilize people when he's been assaulted by the police in order to have uh, demonstrations in front of a police station. We have the uh, tr a tremendously important influence of international human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch, we're very pleased to have as our guest here tonight, Colleen Murphy, who's one of the leaders of Human Rights Watch in Chicago. Human Rights Watch has done extraordinary work inside China, uh, investigating issues that other people haven't looked into. And many of these human rights lawyers have direct phone contact uh, with uh, human rights people outside China, including the Human Rights Watch people in um, Hong Kong. And then numbers of these leading human rights lawyers have uh, not only contacts with leading international newspapers, the BBC, Reuters, the news services, um, but they also take work, such as Sadar's and my work in this New York Times editorial, 
and use it as a way of trying to stir public opinion in the United States. Here's a Christian organization based here in the United States of somebody who fled Tiananmen Square, and they feature, among other things, uh, lawyers who are Christians who have been persecuted. Very rarely, some of these lawyers actually get to Washington. Uh, here's Jiang Kai at a congressional uh, commission on persecution and uh, abrogation of rights um, a couple of years ago. Our preliminary findings then are that these criminal defense lawyers and human rights lawyers, especially the Christian lawyers, uh, have been severely restrained in the last 15 months. There's much potentiality for leadership by these Christian human rights lawyers of the house churches, um, but it hasn't yet happened, and indeed there's some considerable resistance from the house churches. But what these lawyers have managed to do is to build very strong ties outside the country, and so they can get a great deal of international attention when they get into difficulty. So where does this leave us? At the Council on Foreign Relations last year, Sadara and I posed this question. Are these hidden heroes, or the heroes China wants to hide, the vanguard of political liberalism in China? Are they harbingers of a new kind of political society in China based, uh, focused on basic legal freedoms? We do see early signs in China of what our larger project has seen in other countries at other times. There are small numbers of lawyers, some of them are ordinary, some of them are famous, but they continue to fight and they are potential instruments of political liberalism in their struggles for basic legal freedoms. In China, the party state tries to hide them away. It removes their bodies. It shuts down their blogs. It sends them off to black prisons and labor camps. It tries to drive them out of criminal defense work and indeed drive them out of the bar altogether. So at this moment, our American Bar Foundation research has discovered that there are cadres of political liberalism. They are scattered across China, famous lawyers, ordinary lawyers. Most of these people never make headlines, never have their names broadcast across the world. Whether these hidden heroes will ultimately prevail, of course, only history will tell. Thank you. Thank you.